Thank you for attending our virtual third Sunday lecture series. This month, we are featuring David Cauley. David Cauley is a 30-year resident of Burlington and a neighbor living on Nash Place. He has been rediscovering the history of the neighborhood since his retirement as operations manager for Efficiency Vermont. Dave will present some of the less known history about the land between East Avenue and the Winooski River. The area has a history of development that is unique in Burlington. In the early 19th century, the neighborhood was connected not only through land ownership, but by family ties, farming, and mill enterprises, as well as religious con connections. The area was a smuggling hotspot and in 1808, the site of a notorious shootout with federal authorities. The legacies of the past are still with us today, embodied in the streets, buildings, homes, and even one family who has continuously lived in the old East End since the 1830s. We are pleased for Dave to be with us today to help us rediscover the neighborhood that is called the birthplace of Burlington. If you are interested in getting involved with the Old East End Neighborhood Coalition, we have posted a link in the description box below so that you can email them and find out how you can get involved. It is our great pleasure to welcome David Cauley. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me. After retirement about four years ago, I began to walk a lot more through my neighborhood, particularly within the last year. And while I knew some of the history of the neighborhood, I began to realize that there's a lot that I don't know. So the process of learning about the neighborhood has been eye-opening because now the landmarks, the buildings, the homes, streets, parks, natural areas, they all resonate with a new meaning. When I go for a walk, it's like traveling through time. And I can see multiple layers of history unfold right before me and there's always something new to learn. So today, I'm inviting you to walk with me through some of this history, which to me has been hidden in sight until recently. Now to be clear, I'm not a historian. I am an amateur with interest. However, there is a lot of work that has been done to uncover the history of the area. Here are some of the resources that I've used. Most valuable has been the Chittenden County Historical Society Historic Guide to Burlington Neighborhoods, which introduced me, which first introduced me to the history. Sometimes some very nondescript buildings can have some fascinating people and events associated with it. I've also relied heavily on the writings of Vincent uh, Feeney, whose works on Winooski and Burlington were priceless in understanding the backstory of this neighborhood. Gary Shattuck's Insurrection, Corruption, and Murder in Early Vermont is a meticulously researched tale which introduced me to the real frontier life of early Vermont. I particularly enjoyed learning about the national political divisions that existed between the Federalists and the Jeffersonian Republicans and its impacts here in Vermont. I was surprised to learn where the loyalties were aligned. These resources and Bob Blanchard's daily Facebook posting on Burlington area history continue to inspire me to delve deeper into the history. My focus for this presentation is the 1770s through 1850 in what could be called the birthplace of Burlington. From 1784 to 1810, this land along the Winooski River became the economic engine of the region and helped to set the stage for much of the other development that took place in Burlington. Part of my quest was to answer the question, what defines the neighborhood? Where are the boundaries? Who were the people that first developed it and how were they connected? To answer some of these boundary questions, I have pored over some old maps, looking for roads that no longer exist, looking for place names and property ownership. I've walked the neighborhood, observing contours, uh, physical attributes and landmarks. And to better understand the people and their interrelationships, I researched genealogies, read histories, and visited gravesites. We'll see four types of connections geography, family ties, enterprise, and religion. This area has had a lot of names uh, over, the, over its history Winooski Falls, Colchester Falls, Burlington Falls. Winooski Village, Catlinsburg, 
Colchester Ave Corridor, Centennial Neighborhood, and sometimes it's lumped in as part of the UVM and Medical Center or the Hill section. However, there are residents whose family's presence in the neighborhood dates to the early 1800s. Growing up in the neighborhood, Jim Barr recalls that his family and neighbors referred to it as the Old East End. I'd like to offer a note on place names that I use in this presentation. In most places, I refer to the place names by the current name. The city of Winooski was part of Colchester until 1922, but my references will be Winooski. I also use current street names for locations on older maps. Of course, the Winooski River and the Onion River are one and the same. There are two falls on the Winooski River that will be often referred to in the presentation. The upper falls are the small set of rapids above today's Winooski Bridge. The lower falls are the large set of falls below the Winooski Bridge. The neighborhood is a relatively small piece of land on the eastern side of Burlington. This area has a history of development that is separate from Burlington. Often it was left off of early maps of the city or it was lumped in with the, the village of Winooski. The area is bounded in an almost triangular area of about 0.58 square miles or about 370 acres. The northern boundary is the Winooski River. The southeastern boundary is Route 89 and the western boundary is East Ave, extending back down to the river. Today, this area encompasses over 800 dwellings and a mix of families, young professionals, students, and seniors. The diversity of the area is growing. 41% of the neighborhood is owner occupied and 59% is rental housing. Today, there are very few business establishments in the neighborhood. However, some landmarks that you might recognize are Centennial Field, Centennial Woods, Greenmount Cemetery, Chase Mill, Salmon Hole Park, Trinity Campus of UVM, and Shemanska Park. Because of the parks and the river trails, Notice all of the green space in our neighborhood. It's actually a great place to walk around. The falls at Winooski and the river are really the historical heart of the neighborhood and the birthplace of manufacturing in, in Vermont. Today, the Burlington side of the river is included in the Winooski Falls Mill Historic District. But this place's connection goes much deeper than just the history of the mills in the area. It is connected to Burlington's Intervale, which is some of the most biologically diverse land in the state. We have deer, fox, bobcat, as well as diverse flora that populate our neighborhood. Now the falls in adjacent area have a long and continuous history of Native American occupation, as does the entire Champlain Valley. Evidence of early Paleo Indians goes back over 10,000 years. As populations evolve, occupation continued through the Archaic period, which lasted from 8,000 to 2,000 years ago. For the Intervale and the Falls, evidence of Native American and Western Abenaki occupation and settlement from 1,000 BC to today is some of the most prolific in New England. Archaeological excavations along the river have found tools, vessels, food, and fire pits in abundance. Archaeologists can dig almost anywhere in this area and find these markers that remind us of the native presence. And the Lower Falls holds a special place for salmon fishing. There are some early 19th century accounts that describe the number of salmon in the rivers. Now think of this, during spawning season, if one attempted to ford a side stream on horseback, the horse would freeze due to the multitude of salmon ramming into the horse's legs. Another example is when possible settlers would drive a wagon into shallow tributaries of the river and employing their pitchforks spear as many fish as they desired. And it was also claimed that the largest of these salmon weighed 30 to 40 pounds. So you can imagine how important the falls were for years uh, to Native Americans before contact with Europeans. Now, what you see here are some of the Abenaki words for, the, for this place. The Winooski, as well as the Lamoille, the Missisquoi, and Otter Creek were key waterways and 
fertile planting and gathering grounds for the settlement of native people in the area. They were also key networks for travel, trading, and communication. So it was a myth later spread by Europeans and settlers that Vermont was not inhabited by native people. We know that they have continuously lived here. Their pre-European uh, pre pre contact trade networks extended to the uh, Great Lakes and to the main coast and up into Canada. And the Western Abenaki people, having survived a grueling history of constant change, continue their culture and tradition around us in Vermont, throughout New England and Quebec today. Now this slide is a reminder of the drastic change that befell Western Abenaki post-European contact. In essence, it is the story of a change in how the land is treated. For the Abenaki, the land was not owned, but shared, and they were the caretakers. They moved freely in small family bands over the lands. Europeans brought with them the concepts of a specific land ownership. In a relatively short period of time, the land was settled by Europeans and their descendants, despite the efforts of Abenaki to retain their lands. And this brings us to the part of the story where the Allen family impacted what has become the Old East End. In the early 1770s, Ethan Allen led the formation of the Green Mountain Boys to dissuade Yorkers from their claims in the New Hampshire grants. In 1772, Ira, brother Ira Allen uh, and the cousin, remember Baker, and a crew of five others left Skanesboro, which is today Whitehall, New York, to investigate lands along the Onion River. These lands had, were already owned by the Allens, and they were worried about encroachment by New York surveyors. On September 20th, 1772, the party reached the Lower Falls, where they discovered a camp of the New York surveyors. Ira's band captured two of the surveyors and had an armed confrontation with the rest of the surveyors on September 29th. The surveyors were accompanied by 10 Indians. Ira's group had a member who could speak with the Indians, and he told them that there was no quarrel with them and that they were welcome to hunt on their lands as they pleased. The Indians left and the surveyors backed down, and they left also. Ira had the vision and saw the potential of the rich farmlands, water power for the mills, and inexhaustible forests. In his autobiography, he exclaimed, this is the land my soul delighted in. The next spring, Ira formed the Onion River Land Company with Ethan and his other brothers and Remember Baker. In 1773, Ira and Remember Baker set out from Middlebury on a path they cut to the Old East End. They called it a bridle path because it was only fit for horses and not for carriage. Today, this is essentially Route 116. They, attached, uh, they attracted a few buyers for property and built a blockhouse on the Winooski side of the river near the place of today's Winooski Bridge. It also served as a tavern and a general store. Ira made trips over the hill to Burlington Bay and began to realize the potential for a city at this location with great access to the lake for shipping. His path over the hill is what became Colchester Ave, Burlington's first road. The threat of Revolutionary War, British invasion, accompanied by potential British allied Indian attacks, caused most of the settlers to retreat from the Winooski settlement until after the war. Now, after the war, Ira returned to the area in 1783. By 1784, he had built a crib dam to manage water flow for the mills. Now, to give you a sense of how the crib dam changed the water flow, the photo on the left is from the late 19th century uh, when a dam was still in place. The falls appear to be 10 to 15 feet high and very uniform. The photo on the right is a recent shot of the upper falls today. The natural ledge on the river creates falls, but nothing like the crib dam, which increased power for the mills and created a pond behind the dam for a ferry crossing. Now here we see an aerial view of this part of the river. The crib dam location is represented by the dotted orange line in the photo. Behind the dam, the white dotted line indicates where Iris Ferry probably operated. Also notice 
that the ferry, ferry line uh, crossing aligns with Chase Street. This is one of the oldest streets in the city. This path is uh, to the ferry dates to 1784, and it's on every old map of Burlington that I've seen, including a map originated in 1789. The ferry was probably a cable ferry in which the user pulls or pull, pulls themselves across the river with the ferry being guided by an overhead rope as shown in the upper left. Also notice the bend in the river at this point. This feature is important to the development of the Burlington side of the river because as anybody who canoes or kayaks knows, the inside bend of the river is the most powerful current. The powerful current combined with a relatively flat plateau made this spot a perfect location for water powered mills. This is one of the reasons why mill development started early on the Burlington side of the river. Plus, a little further downstream is the Lower Falls, which runs most powerfully on the Burlington side. One other note um, from this photo, notice how Chase Street curves. Um, we will observe this on some old maps in a moment. One of the old East End neighbors told me that they thought this used to be an old road, uh, perhaps built by Ira Allen long before Patchen Road. Uh, and Patchen Road was built in the 1850s. Now this is a wonderful representation of the area as it may have looked in 1795, created by local historian David Blow. To orient ourselves, this is the bend in the river that we just saw. Here we see the ferry crossing landing on the Burlington side at the bottom of Chase Street. Ira Allen had built sawmills on both ends of the crib dam. And note the site of Old Fort Frederick, the blockhouse built by Ira and remember Baker in 1773. This is the location of Ira Allen's home, which he built in 1785. The site is today's uh, Winooski Block Building. Now here's Ira's path to Burlington Bay, today's Colchester Ave. Note it curves right into Chase Street and that there is no Winooski Bridge. And note, here is an area called the Rolling Place. As we will see, timber became the first economic driver for the area. Timber would be cut in the surrounding woodlands, rolled down the hill to float the logs in the river. The rolling place is the backside of Greenmount Cemetery down through Shemanska Park. Also note, below the lower falls is where the lumber rafts were put together to transport to Canada. This area also became a shipbuilding area in the 1800s. And finally, notice how this piece of property juts into the river as the river makes a U-turn around it. Let's call it the neck. We will look for this feature on old Burlington maps to identify this area. The settlement of the area continued to grow, so that in 1791, there were 137 residents. The industries included two sawmills, a grist mill, a forge, and a trip hammer mill, which is a water power pounding device for grain and metal. Here, the first mills begin to line up along the Burlington side of the river. So how did the early roads shape the Old East End? Well, for starters, roads led to river crossings, as Ira Allen's Chase Street landing just illustrated. And river crossings were needed to access land and to get goods to Canada. So the second crossing of the Winooski River was built in 1789, and it was called the High Bridge. This crossing is approximately where today's Lime Kiln Road Bridge crosses the gorge. And it wasn't until 1805 that a bridge was built to cross directly from the old East End to the Winooski. Now this is a map from 1835 with a little broader view of the area. To orient you, this is the neck that we just looked at. Um, and you can see Colchester Ave uh, coming into it. Now this is East Ave. Um, you know, it's which was informally designated as the eastern boundary of Burlington. Often the area of East Ave was not even, even included in old Burlington maps. The dotted line that you see represents today's Patchen Road. 
and here is Williston Road, although back in 1835, it was called Winooski Turnpike. And for those of you that drive to the post office on White Street in South Burlington, have you ever wondered why the street is positioned at such an odd angle? Well, here is White Street, which in 1835, it was the road to Muddy Brook, which was another area of mills. And this is what I call a lost road. This road no longer exists. The road was in today's Vermont National Air Guard property, but in 1835, a road that I would call the Chase Street Extension, traveling east much closer to the river and connecting the old east end to the high bridge and Route 116. It's likely that Ira and remember Baker cut a direct path from Middlebury to the Winooski River and then followed the river to the old east end. The path became Chase Street Extension and was still in use in 1835. By 1852, Patchen Road made a direct connection to Williston Road, so the Chase Street extension went out of use. Now let's take a closer look. This is a map from 1810, although it's based on a map from 1879. Here's the old East End neck. Notice how the lots were originally surveyed. These are 100 acre lots. Notice that lots 19, 20, and 21 extend westward from the neck toward East Ave. These lots comprise the heart of the old East End because this land originally owned by the Allens was passed on to Allen family heirs that developed it. If you look closely, the dotted lines represent the roads that existed at the time. So here's East Ave, which originally extended all the way to the river for access to the Intervale lands. And here is the path from Burlington Bay through the old East End, down Chase Street, and to what I was calling the Chase Street extension. And finally here was the road that was leading up from Route 116 to the High Bridge. Now this line represents uh, today's Route 89. So the center of these lines and the neck form, form the old East End. By comparison, this is the area in shaded that is designated by French Front Porch Forum as the Centennial Neighborhood. So you can see how it overlaps. Here again is the aerial views. This is the neck uh, for reference. So how did the area develop after the Allens and before it was called Centennial? This is the rest of the story. By the late 1780s, Trade with the British in Canada was becoming an economic uh, driver for the area. Colchester Ave became the route to Canada and consequently commerce began to spring up along the route. The Onion River Land Company's business model depended on brother Levi Allen in Canada lining up sales of timber and potash to sell while buying goods. The, early, the goods that the early settlement needed and that could be resold. Everything was done on credit so there was tremendous pressure for the settlement at the Upper Falls to produce. The tension is evident in a letter written to, uh, from Levi to Ira in August of 1786, when he said, without punctuality, trade is not worth a continental dam. Well, meaning we've got to get the goods to Canada on time or else. In another correspondence, Levi said to Ira, it's a ridiculous farce to pretend to trade without making payment, meaning without cash, we're gonna be sunk. So this is, uh, you can feel this distress also in a letter that the manager of the sawmill, James Hawley wrote to Levi Allen, explaining the destruction of the spring in 1787 at the falls. It's all gone to the devil. One half of the dam is gone entirely. The mills are dead, grist mill and all. Is it, it's impossible that there should be anything of a raft made out of this spring. So he was pretty desperate to try to get production going, but it actually took another whole year before they could drive a lumber raft to Canada to, co to cover the debts they owed. <clears throat> another ominous event occurred in February of 1789, when Ethan Allen died on the early morning ride back to Burlington from his cousin Ebenezer's home in South Hero. 
in preparation for burial, his body lay at Ira's home in Winooski as dozens of Green Mountain boys came to pay their respects. On the cold morning of February 16th, they formed a procession and escorted the casket from Ira's home across the river rice at Ira's Ferry Landing and then up Chase Street and Colchester Ave to Green Mount Cemetery. The caisson stopped every 10 paces to fire a volley in respect. And Green Mount Cemetery is the oldest institution in Burlington as this land was set aside as a burying ground in 1763 as part of the original grant from Benning Wentworth. Now, as Ira Allen continued to run the Onion River Land Company enterprises in 1790s, trouble with creditors continued. By 1795, the company entangled in several lawsuits began to unravel. One of these suits was brought by Lucinda Allen Catlin, daughter of Heman Allen. Now, Heman was brother of Ethan and Ira, had died due to his injur injuries received in the Battle of Bennington. Lucinda sued for his share of the company because Ira did not recognize Heman's will that designated his share of the company to Lucinda. The case was in fact heard by the US Supreme Court Justice John Jay in Windsor. In its heyday, the company owned over 330,000 acres of, of land. By 1798, the lawsuit was settled and Lucinda and her husband, Moses Catlin, inherited 824 acres of land, including a good portion of the acres in lots 19, 20, and 21, with a value of over $23,000. So the Catlin family became the first family of the Old East End and a prominent influence in early history of Burlington. The family was of English ancestry, having come to England uh, with William the Conqueror in 1066. Several of their ancestors were distinguished men of their day, several of them be being knighted. The great-grandfather of Moses, John Catlin, was born in England in 1646 and came to America in 1665. The family settled in Hartford, Connecticut and migrated to Litchfield, Connecticut. Alexander Catlin Sr. had eight children, of which four came to Burlington. So on this slide, we see the Catlin family members that came to Burlington. And a couple of things you can see right off the bat was there, here we have a lot of Litchfield connections. So the Allen family uh, and, and their base from Litchfield along with the Catlins from Litchfield. Now, Abigail was the oldest firstborn and she married Ozias Buell, uh, also from Litchfield. Uh, the second born was Lynn Catlin. Now he didn't come to Burlington. He actually went to uh, Yale University and then uh, moved to New York City. He got into banking there and fortunate for him uh, as he made the acquaintance of John Jacob Astor. And he and Astor brought financial resources to the Catlin empire as it grew in the early 1800s in Burlington. Now, as we mentioned, Moses married Lucinda Allen, you know, the, the niece of Ira Allen, um, but also his brother Guy Catlin married uh, Melinda Wattams. And it turns out that Melinda and Lucinda were stepsisters. When Heman died, uh, Lucinda's mother married a Wattams. And so they were stepsisters. So these, these families were very tightly interconnected. And finally, Alexander Catlin, uh, did move to Burlington. I think he was part of the lumbering and timbering operations, but he died early. And in fact, he drowned in Lake Champlain. So, you know, this, this was really the first family and they were bound for success in their, in, you know, they were great entrepreneurs really. Uh, and this left homes in, in Burlington, uh, some of which were very substantial, some of them which are, were modest. Um, but, it, they still exist today. So here at the bottom, of, on the left-hand side, at the bottom of Colchester Avenue, 457, was the home of Guy Catlin. It was built in 1809 at the age of 26, and he and his family lived there until 1825. Um, he sold it to another Old East End entrepreneur, which we will meet, uh, Alfred Day. At the time, this, the home sold for $950, along with some riverfront property for Day's paper mill. 
Today, this is a five unit apartment building with little exterior evidence that a notable person once lived here. Next to this, you see the home built by Moses Catlin in 1806. The home is recognizable at its third location today as the UVM John Johnson House. It's the former home of the notable surveyor, architect, and builder from Burlington. Now, Moses and Lucinda Catlin sold this house to Johnson in 1809. And the story goes that Lucinda wanted a home with a better view of the lake. So she made Moses climb a tree on the highest hill in the neighborhood to survey the site. Apparently, Moses gave a good report from the top of the tree because they built their next home on Catlin's Hill in 1809. And the home stood at that location until 1879 when the property was sold to make way for Mary Fletcher's Hospital. So today's Hospital Hill, corner of Colchester and East Ave, was originally Catlin's Hill. At one time, I've seen on maps, uh, East Ave called the road east of Catlin's Hill. And finally, another Catlin family home is located at 262 Pearl Street. Um, built in 1812, this was the home of Abigail Catlin Buell and her husband, Ozias. Now, like the Catlins, Ozias was involved in several Old East End enterprises, including sawmills, retail stores, and property. A, hist a historical note is that Buell's daughter, Harriet, was the first wife of George Perkins Marsh, America's first environmentalist, who lived a block away when he came to Burlington to study law. Unfortunately, she died from complications of childbirth at the age of 33. Today, the brick home is a nondescript four-unit apartment building. Now, what sort of enterprises did the Catlins undertake? Well, by inheriting the land from I.R. Allen, they picked up where he left off with timber and lumber rafts to Canada. Gary Shattuck offered some insights into the difficult and dangerous business of running timber rafts to Canada. Now, in the winter, they'd cut the timber, roll it down to the river onto the ice. In the spring, as the ice melted, they would assemble the logs below the Great Falls in cribs which is a 25 square foot unit. Then the cribs were tied together, forming a huge raft, big enough to hold four masts uh, with square sails. Sometimes they would place huts around the perimeter and they'd even have a fireplace on them. Long oars were used to steer and power the craft when there was no wind. When they reached the rapids, the raft was disassembled back down into the cribs. And then after they passed, they reassembled the the raft after that. So this was big business in the North Country in 1807 with 340 rafts carrying an estimated 6,000 cords of wood transported on the St. Lawrence River between Chateauguay and Montreal. Now the Catlins also ran the sawmill they inherited on the Burlington side of the Winooski River. Uh, through their brother's connection with John Jacob Astor, they also served as trading agents. They would transport potash on their rafts and return with retail goods to sell their store in the Old East End. This slide is the work of uh, Chris Whitman, who did a wonderful study of the mills on the Burlington side of the river for the UVM Historic Preservation Program. The success of the Catlin import-export operations led to reinvestment in the mills. Um, by the 1830s, the Old East End had so many Catlin businesses that the area was known as Catlin's Falls or Catlinsburg. These mills included manufacturing of linseed oil, plaster, metal stamping, and the hammer mill, as well as the, the sawmill. Now, in one of the, the longest lasting enterprises over on the left side, the Catlins started a grist mill, which was right above the lower falls. Now, this mill. The mill at the site originally washed away and was rebuilt in 1828. In the photo, you see the building to the left of the bridge as it looked in the 1880s. This property has a long history as a mill operated by another famous Old East End resident, George Edgecombe, who we'll also meet shortly. Water flowed through the basement of this building to power the shafts for grinding the wheat. In the late 1880s, an electric dynamo was added to generate electricity that powered the streetcars that ran along Riverside Ave. 
After almost 100 years, the building was destroyed for good in the flood of 1927. Now, on the eastern side of the old East End Neck, hosted a wide variety of small mills. This is the site of today's Chase Mill. This parcel of land sits right where the current is most powerful. These early mills were small affairs and would employ you know, 10 to 20 people each. And here is the uh, Alfred Day built the first paper mill uh, right next to the sawmill in 1814. Now Day used the process to turn rags into paper because the uh, wood pulp uh, from paper or paper from wood pulp wasn't even developed to 1843. So first large volumes of water were used to clean the rags and then the rags were set into a digester to, to be broken down when boiled with lye. Finally, the rag engine, also known as a beater, consisted of a tub filled with rags of water, which were beaten to a pulp by a set of rotating blades powered by the water wheel. Alfred had first used this process in Milton, but he was persuaded to move to the Old East End in 1813 by the publisher of the Burlington Sentinel, uh, Samuel Mills, that was the paper of the day in Burlington. The operation uh, consisted of one digester, one engine, two presses. Now, Alfred Day instituted a supply chain for rags by enlisting post riders to collect rags as they delivered the mail through the surrounding towns. By 1820, the mill was processing 16 tons of rags a year and employed six women and four men. Now, many people think of this area, uh, 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 when they think of this area, they think of the textile mills. And textile mills were part of the early history, but not at the scale that it occurred after the 1830s. Amos Weeks, also from Litchfield, Connecticut, set up a clothier works in 1802. Now the Catlins started something called a satinette factory here, uh, making a fine quality yarn in 1814. Carding machines were used in the factory to straighten and untangle the fibers of wool before yarn could be spun. By 1838, the factory had grown in size to 100 by 50 feet with 40 looms, and they even built a brick boarding house for the workers. Now take note of this operation on the eastern side of, of the area. It's called the Winooski Patton Block Mill. And we'll be returning to it because of its impact on the other small mills in the old East End. Now in 1808, there was an incident that drew national attention to Burlington and it involved some of the business leaders of the old East End. To put this incident in context, the British and the US diplomatic relations were declining due to British impressing of American uh, sailors at sea and economic inequalities. In 1807, Thomas Jefferson created an embargo on US trade with Britain. This had a devastating economic effect on Northern Vermont because, because almost all trade was with Canada uh, for items like lumber, potash, and livestock. A lot of this trade came through the Old East End on its way to Canada. Because of the embargo, smuggling of goods to Canada became prominent with boats leaving the Winooski River and sailing to the Richelieu. Well, one of the most prolific of the smugglers' boats was called the Black Snake, a boat that had worked as a ferry between Charlotte and Essex, New York. The boat was 40 feet in length and 14 feet wide. When not propelled by sail on a single mast, it was maneuvered by 14 oars. And it got its name from being smeared with black tar rather than being painted and for its speed. In 1808, Jefferson called for troops to be activated to stop smuggling operations from Vermont to Canada. Well, this led to confrontation on the Winooski River, about one mile west of the Lower Falls. Here's how it unfolded. The Black Snake, led by Truman Mudgett and a crew of six smugglers, came up the Winooski River on August 2nd, 1808, to pick up a load of goods for, for a smuggling run. They stopped at a place called Joy's Landing. On the same day, Francis Lagarde, age 23, and originally from Litchfield, Connecticut, decided to go from South Hero to Burlington to repay a debt owed to uh, Burlington merchant Samuel Fitch. As he came to the sandbar, he encountered Sam Mix, an associate of Mudgeon. 
Mudge, uh, Mix explained that he needed to get a message to Mudgett to warn the smugglers that they were under pursuit by a federal revenue cutter with a crew of 14 agents. The name of the cutter was the Fly, and its mission was to seize the Black Snake. So Mix offered Lagarde a rowboat and $5 to deliver the message. Lagarde agreed to warn the smugglers. He got underway, but camped at the mouth of the Winooski River that night. The next morning proved to be foggy. So he proceeded and he ended up going past Joy's Landing because of the fog and ended up at the Lower Falls. Lagarde went on to look for Guy Catlin at his store, but did not find anybody up at that early hour. Uh, so uh, he went back to uh, the landing. Yeah, he went back to the Joyce Landing. Uh, there he told Mudgett about the warning of the federal boat. Well, they both decided to go to Fitch's store near the UVM Green. Lagarde wanted to square up his debt. Mudgett wanted to procure more ammunition. Upon arrival, they received encouragement from Fitch to confront the Federals and that they should be rewarded. And he also said that they would be considered cowards if somehow they let the Federals seize the Black Snake. Well, next, they went to the store of uh, Reuben Harmon on Pearl Street. Harmon later opened a store in the Old East End, as we'll see. Harmon encouraged the insurrectionists by telling Mudgett to fight, uh, to fight his boat and that the country was ready to take up arms to defend the evaders of the embargo laws. Well, then they walked to the Old East End to find Guy Catlin. Um, at this point, he was at the store. And knowing there would be a confrontation with the Federals, Catlin supported the smugglers by supplying them with a bag of black powder and eight pounds of lead. Lagarde later testified at the trial that Catlin cautioned them to take the most extreme action possible to stop the government's action. And he told Mudgett to, quote, kill every man belonging to the revenue boat and not let one escape alive to tell the news. They completed their meeting with Catlin after he drawed some spirits and urged us to drink. Well, then they returned to Joy's Landing. So about noon, the, the fly appeared uh, on the Winooski River and arrived at Joy's Landing. The smugglers who were on shore threatened to blow the man's brains out who first lays a hand on the black snake. However, the Federals were able to take the unmanned black snake in tow and began to head down, back down the river. The smugglers ran alongside the river and hurled insults and threats. And about a hundred yards down the path, the smugglers opened fire with three volleys on the Federal boat. And then a fatal shot hit federal crew member Elias Drake, a 20-year-old private from Clarendon, Vermont. At that point, the smugglers retreated along the bank of the river and they were pursued by the Federals on foot. Within another few hundred yards, the smugglers turned and fired upon two Federals and a neighbor who had joined to assist the Federals. The blast killed one Federal, wounded another, and killed the neighbor, Jonathan Orsby, a Revolutionary War hero. The smugglers were eventually captured, tried, and sent to prison, with one member of the group hung at a public execution in Burlington's Old North End. The connection to the Old East End is that Guy and, Cat and Moses, Moses Catlin, who supported and enabled smuggling, allegedly supplied the smugglers with ammunition used in the murders, but this was never proved. Now the Black Snake Affair did not end Catlin's smuggling efforts. In 1810, Moses and Guy were joined by their brother Lynn in a partnership with Gideon King as owners of the sloop Saucy Fox. In this vessel, the entrepreneurs used a loophole in the federal law that allowed neutral vessels to trade during the embargo. For this scheme, they employed a Spaniard, Ramon Mancuso, to sail Saucy Fox under the flag of Spain to bring goods from Canada to Burlington. To ensure success, Catlins may have involved 
it may have been involved in getting the U.S. collector of customs at the border replaced with an ally of theirs, Cornelius Peter Van Ness. By 1813, the Catlins, with backing from John Jacob Astor, partnered with Van Ness to form the Champlain Steamboat Company, owners of the Phoenix, the Champlain, Congress, and Phoenix II, shuttling passengers and goods around Lake Champlain up to St. Jean, Quebec. From 1814 to 1820, the Catlin Steamboat Company ruled shipping and passenger trade on Lake Champlain, but competition was growing. By 1833, the company was purchased by Lake Champlain Transportation Company, which went on to dominate steamship travel on Lake Champlain for the next half century, or century and a half. Now, in addition to the Catlins, there were other entrepreneurs in the Old East End. And here are a few, several of whom we've already met. Amos Weeks uh, was in textiles early. Now he married a Sabre Boardman. When he died, Sabre married her cousin, Henry Boardman, who became a real estate developer in the Old East End, building tenement housing for the growing mills. We also met uh, Alfred Day and his paper mill. Well, he was joined by his brother, Dan from Royalton, who came to the Old East End and partnered to start a retail store in 1824. Reuben Harmon, of course, was the supporter of the insurrections in the Black Snake Affair. And William Kidder was the first, uh, first operated a tavern and hotel on Colchester Avenue in 1825. The hotel burned down two years later. He turned to opening a brickyard on Riverside Ave. Alfred Duncan was a longtime blacksmith and wheelwright serving the area for over 50 years until 1883. So the legacies of these individuals are also still here today. The Reuben Harmon store, uh, he opened in 1810 in the Old East End just after the Black, Black Snake Affair. Harmon, Harmon partnered with Amos Weeks on land sold by Moses Catlin. In the 1830s, that store transferred to Catlin's brother-in-law, Ozias Buell. Today, the building still stands as apartments and a Domino's pizza. Embedded in the building are planks that were sawn off in the Catlin's sawmill. The home of uh, William, Kid, uh, William Kidder was built in 1832. The Kidder family resided at this home for generations. The patriarch died in 1856, and his son William Jr. lived in the home up until 1894. The third generation to occupy the home was John Franklin Kidder, who started a successful plumbing and steam fitting business. By 1902, he was designing precision tools. And by 1921, he opened up a shop next door to the manufacture of the tools. And that building still remains today as an apartment building. The fourth generation of the Kidder family was the great granddaughter of William Kidder, Minerva. Uh, and she lived in that home until 1932. Now here we have a story of a family with even a longer legacy in the Old East End, and it continues to this day. It involves one of the oldest buildings in the city of Burlington. The story starts at 411 Colchester Ave, which was probably built before 1791. It was the home and tavern of Thomas Ames. At the time, Colchester Ave was already a major thoroughfare. According to Glenn Fay, Ebenezer Allen wrote to Ira Allen from Ames Tavern in January of 1795. Now Ames sold the tavern in 1811 and the Boardman brothers, Amos and Henry, purchased the property in 1817 with several outbuildings. In 1834, Henry Boardman sold the property to George Edgecombe, who as we've learned was the Catlin's miller at the flouring mill. Uh, he began to build his, his uh, property by adding more property. He, initially, it was about 14.6 acres, and then he added another seven, 75. And by 1835, he had added a, an additional 11, as well as a new barn. So that by 1837, George was fully engaged in farming and left the employee of the Catlins at the flower mill. He grew wheat for seed on his farm for the next 28 years and he died in 1865. Now his children remained in the neighborhood, his son William living at the 411 Colchester home and his daughter Jane married Edwin Chase. And this began a long legacy at 21 Chase Street. 
Edwin Chase purchased the site from his father-in-law in 1848, and the home was built sometime before 1869. Now, originally George wanted the street named George Street, but Chase had his way and the street has remained Chase Street ever since. Note here the generations that follow on Chase Street, including John Barr. Now, John was a former Brigadier General in the US Army, but locally he was a uh, historian and he actually helped part of the original restoration of the Ethan Allen Homestead. His son, J Jim Barr, lives in the home today. George's other daughter, Grace, uh, married Lorenzo Ainsworth, and they lived at 329 Colchester Avenue. As we will see in a moment, the Edgecombe Estate constituted a large, large share of the old East End property by 1890. And here are some of the enterprises that the Edgecombe, Chase, and Sibley family uh, engaged in. Uh, we talked about the flowering mill uh, that George worked there, and then he moved into the farming in uh, 1865. Now, Edwin Chase, he actually partnered with one of the Catlin cousins to purchase a window and sash company in Winooski. That business grew, and by 1857, he moved it down to the Burlington waterfront as part of the pioneer mechanic shops that were there. Uh, he died in 1878. His son-in-law, uh, Hiram Sibley, became, had become a manage for, manager for him in that factory, and the, the, the business sold uh, to the J.R. Booth Company also in 1878. Now we mentioned that Edgecombe property really constituted a large area, about 37% of what we've called the old East End. And here you can see what that, uh, in the overlays, what that property would have looked like. It surrounded uh, Greenmount Cemetery and incorporated Shemanska Park, today's Centennial Field and Centennial Woods. So uh, for, you know, the significance of the property to us today is that George's daughter, Grace, died in 1903 and sold the property to UVM. 12 acres were set apart for the athletic field and 40 acres set apart for the natural area. And because 1904 was the 100th anniversary of the first graduating class of UVM, UVM president Matthew Buckham announced the name of these areas as Centennial Field and Centennial Woods as part of these celebrations. It's interesting to note that the money that UVM made on, the, on just the sale of the house paid for the entire purchase of the land that they acquired. Up to this point, we've seen some deep connections between the early residents of the Old East End uh, through places of origin, family ties, business partnerships. Here are some religious connections and influence of the Old East End neighbors. Moses and Lucinda Catlin and Moses' sister and brother-in-law were among the original 14 founders of the First Congregational Church on South Minnesota Ave in Burlington. Dan Day later joined this church and became a deacon. William Kidder and Dan Day uh, joined the First Congregational Society in Winooski in 1836. The founders brought forth a new church building that was completed in 1840 and was designed by Amy Young. The church stood on the corner of Main Street and Mounts Bay Ave in Winooski until 1992, when it was sold to become Winooski's first town hall. Now, you've probably not seen a chart like this before. <laughs> I call it the octopus chart, and it's my attempt to map some of these interrelationships that we've just been talking about. Um, it's probably not different than from any other era when people migrate from one place to another, Families follow, personal connections matter, business and family life blend together. I'm sure there were advantages and disadvantages for families and neighbors to be so interconnected. But as in other parts of Vermont, the move westward happened in the 1830s and the 1840s. So many of the children moved and to settle in the West. And this is why it's rare for a family to identify with a single neighborhood for six or seven generations. Another reason for a neighborhood change was disaster, natural and otherwise. Fire and floods wrecked the old East End time and again over a hundred years. I was surprised to learn how many times that the mills had to be rebuilt and was astounded at the resilience of the Catlins and others that did this. The close family bonds that they had must have helped during those times of rebuilding. 
By the mid 1330s, however, the seeds of permanent change to the neighborhood were planted by the coming of large scale textile operations. In 1835, Burlington businessmen came together to start the Burlington Woolen Mill on the Winooski side of the river. The scope of the project overshadowed any mill that had been built to date. The six story building required 2 million bricks, 300,000 board feet of lumber, and the project required hundreds of jobs to build a 41,000 square foot building. It was completed in 1838. And of course it needed hundreds of workers and really inspired some of the first urban planning in Winooski. Now, meanwhile, on the Burlington side of the river, the Catlins had their own large scale project in mind. Remember the Winooski patent block company that we saw in the mill area along the Burlington side? Well, the Catlins and other investors, including New York investors and George Perkins Marsh, thought that this, would, this project would be their greatest. They purchased the right to the only patented machine in America that could manufacture blocks used in commercial sailing for block and tackle rigging. Up to that point, blocks were custom made by hand. And the age of sail still predominated, particularly ocean going sail. So this project was considered bound to succeed. In 1835, they built a three story factory with a tall chimney to accommodate a steam boiler and an 80 horsepower water wheel. Unfortunately, the factory only operated for three years. In 1838, a fire started in the factory and spread to the other mills, and all of them except the, the grist mill that was there. This was the final blow to the Catlin's manufacturing empire. The block factory was never rebuilt. So the 1838 fire really cleared the way for a generation of new mill on the Burlington side of the river. By 1846, two Burlington businessmen, William uh, Vilas and Marillo Noyes, started a cotton mill. This mill transitioned to the Winooski Cotton Mill, 1860, and then to the Burlington Cotton Mill, 1868. The area also served as the site of Chase Mill, which was built in 1906. Now, the large mills and the need for worker housing precipitated the sale of old East End farmlands. The housing boom from the late 1880s through the 1930s drastically changed the neighborhood. So my journey to rediscover the history of the neighborhood continues as I will research the large mill area to find out what happened to the neighborhood and the people who lived here between 1850 and the present. Certainly there's a deeper history that happened here before UVM purchased the Centennial property in 1906. And I'm glad that the Barr family introduced me to the idea of the old East End, lost roads, family ties, industrial ingenuity, and a bit of insurrection. I hope this story has helped to expand your understanding of the neighborhood, the birthplace of Burlington. I thank you and back to you, Dan. Hi, all right, let me just stop the recording. Next month, we are very excited to welcome Angela Valentinetti, who is going to present on historical treasures found in the Vermont State Archives, all kinds of interesting and obscure things that don't often see the light of day. Also, if you like this lecture series and would like to support the Homestead's programming, please go to the donation link in the description box below to find out how you can support us to allow us to keep you informed and keep our programming coming. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next month.